I've made time steps for each section, so if I start talking about something you don't care about, you can just jump to the next section. This is my Subaru Forester. Wait, wait, let's go back to the beginning. I got my 2019 Subaru Forester Premium in October of 2018, a little early. I was extremely excited because I waited a year for the new model called the SK. About three months later, I had a one inch spacer lift by ADF that bumped the ground clearance up to 9.7. I took it off-road a few times at the Dirty Turtle Off-Road Park in Kentucky and some forest service roads in Virginia while I was visiting my dad, and I was extremely impressed with the vehicle's performance, especially considering the smooth tires that it came with. But then, when the car was only seven months old, tornadoes hit Dayton and pummeled my car with some very large hail. The steel roof had some minor dents, but the aluminum hood took a pounding. The hail caused $4,300 worth of damage to my new car. But I didn't think it looked that bad, especially because the vehicle is white. So after the $500 deductible, I got to pocket the remainder. This significantly accelerated the off-road modifications. So let's start with the single most important thing, tires. There's a lot of trade space here. Let me explain my choices and their implications. My 245, 65, 17 BF Goodrich KO2s are 0.7 inches wider and 2 inches taller than the stock tires. Half of that 2 inches of height turns into extra ground clearance. These bigger, wider, more aggressive tires provide a ton of traction, but I did have to make some sacrifices. The larger tires increased my overall gear ratio. The CVT, with its continuous gears, is able to automatically adjust for this at normal driving speed, but when I'm slowly crawling over tricky obstacles, the lowest ratio might not be low enough to provide the necessary torque. This is rare, but when it happens, it forces me to either use more speed and momentum or use the winch. Also, these tires are louder and heavier and less efficient. The Bridgestone Ecotopias weigh only 24 pounds compared to the 44 pounds for a KO2. That's 20 extra pounds per tire. And the effect of increased rolling mass is significant. You can, however, save five pounds. So it would only be 15 extra pounds if you were to choose the slightly quieter, lighter Falcon Wild Peak AT3W, which has very similar off-road performance. Or you could go crazy and get an even more aggressive mud terrain tires. There's a lot of trade space here. I had a one inch lift when I switched to the larger tires, but I've heard that you can run them without a lift. There was a tiny amount of harmless rubbing against the front of one of the wheel well liners, but you can fix that with a heat gun and a gloved hand. You will see where the tire has rubbed it clean. You can just soften the area with a heat gun and press it outward with a gloved hand. The area that you need to adjust is small. Let's talk about wheels. Offset, or how far the tire sticks out of the wheel well, is very important when maximizing tire size. The factory wheels have a positive 48 millimeters of offset. The wheels that I chose have a positive 45 millimeters of offset. Slightly less, but very close. I think that a lot of offset looks cool, but it adds stress to the wheel bearings, and it wouldn't work in this case. Jump to present day. Notice how my fully tucked rear tire is behind the wheel arch. If the wheel sat farther out, it would have hit. I chose these wheels because they're on Amazon, black, cheap, aluminum, and they had a offset that was very similar to the stock offset. I also purchased hub-centric spacers and special lug nuts that work with the wheels. Let's talk about the second most important thing off-road, suspension. After the one inch ADF lift, I moved to Ready Lift's two inch kit. At $400, it is a great value, but it does not include rear subframe spacers. These are important for keeping your rear wheels centered in the wheel wells and also being able to get the rear wheels into alignment. They weren't able to get it perfect, but it was close enough that even after a year, my tires are still fine. One thing I noticed when switching to the two inch lift is a vibration at about 17 miles per hour during moderate acceleration. I eliminated this by adding the transmission mount insert. Subaru's original design allows for a lot of play in the transmission via some soft rubber bushings. This additional rubber piece decreases the range of movement, but it does not totally eliminate it, which is perfect. Recently, the Ironman 4x4 America released the epic all-terrain suspension, or ATS kit, for the Forester Outback and Crosstrek. 
This kit does include rear subframe spacers, nice ones, anodized aluminum, and it provides a two inch lift, but it does so with longer struts and springs instead of spacers. This means that you get the two inch lift and more travel and articulation. Articulation is so important that off-road enthusiasts have made a metric called the Ramp Travel Index, or RTI. It's calculated by finding the maximum distance that you can drive along a 20 degree ramp with one wheel without lifting the other three tires. Take that diagonal distance, then divide by the vehicle's wheelbase to normalize for size, and then multiply by 1,000 to get the RTI score. Higher is better. With both sway bars disconnected, or in my case, completely removed, I was able to get my tire 19 inches vertically high. If that ramp was at a 20 degree angle, my wheel would have traveled 55.6 inches along it. Now divide that by the vehicle's wheelbase, which is 105.1, multiply by 1,000, and you get 525. Now let's compare that against this table of off-road legends. Pretty impressive. Plus, you get the superior comfort and handling of fully independent suspension. Speaking of fully independent suspension, the Ironman kit has stiffer springs all the way around that allow you to carry more gear. This helps to prevent the Subaru saggy butt where the back of the car sags when you load anything in the back more than groceries. These stiffer springs also naturally decrease body roll. For me, it's enough that I feel comfortable with both of my sway bars gone. This was not the case with the stock soft springs. The sway bar end links are easy to remove so you can do a test for yourself. Tom the Dilettante made a great video about this, you should check it out. If you want to see the Ironman suspension in action, you can check out my trail test video. One last thing, considering that the rear subframe is now lower, it's a good idea to add the carrier bearing spacer to keep your rear drive shaft aligned. Let's talk about skid plates. Underbody protection is critical. You can see here where, I'm, where I hit my transmission oil pan on a rock. If the hit was harder, or if the rock was sharper, my transmission would have bled out on the trail. This was a wake up call. When I got home, I ordered all three skid plates from Primitive Racing. They're made out of 3 16 aluminum, they're lightweight, they won't rust, and they provide significant protection. They're easy to install and they protect all of the vital components. Here are the before and after shots. You can see the rear diff, the transmission oil pan, and in the front, the engine oil pan. When you order yours, be sure to pay the extra money to get the extended front lip. If not, it'll look kind of like a cheese grater. Here you can see where they have done a lot of protecting. The DIY winch bumper. The winch is a Warren Axon 55S. It is very compact and it has a great little extra called the Warren Hub that connects where you usually connect the controller. It allows you to control the winch with your phone over Bluetooth. It also displays the voltage, temperature, and pulling load. It is the winch that Warren recommends with their bumper. When I saw the Warren semi-hidden winch bumper, I was extremely excited until I took a closer look. Unfortunately, it does nothing to improve the Forester's approach angle. Luckily, I have a friend, yeah, that one with a giant excursion, that also likes off-roading and knows how to weld. We started by replacing the crash bar with a new one that holds a winch. This would be a great place to stop if you care about the look of your vehicle. One of the aftermarket companies should really make and sell such a product. I was more interested in improving the approach angle and adding protection, so I kept cutting and removing everything that wasn't critical. We were able to significantly improve the approach angle, but we were ultimately limited by the lower horizontal radiator support. A true lunatic would have cut this. An even better approach angle would have been nice, but we made a big improvement and the bumper is so strong that it's fine when it hits. The whole bumper is made from 3 16 steel, so it is very strong, but also very heavy. Building it from aluminum would have been better, but I'm not complaining. In fact, I really appreciate all of Andrew's help with this build. Thanks, man. I can't fully recommend a DIY bumper like this because it requires quite a few additional modifications. I had to remove the active air shutter and fool the fancy continuous rotation servo. This required a custom piece of plastic. I've shared my design on Thingiverse, by the way it needs to be really strong. After breaking a couple of my prints, I ordered a professional one in nylon from Shapeways. 
Also, even with that extra cooling vent down there gone, I haven't had any overheating problems, even when hitting the trails on hot summer days. I also had to remove the windshield washer fluid reservoir that was in front of the driver's side tire. In theory, you could relocate it, but living without it has been surprisingly easy. The air intake resonator in front of the other tire was already gone because of my DIY air intake. The DIY intake. You might be surprised to hear that I did not modify the intake to try to increase performance. Subaru's design already does a good job of pulling clean, cold air from the grill. I originally started messing with mine because of this deep creek crossing. Side note, I still need to do the rear diff breather extension mod. I changed both diff oils when I got home, and the rear one was nasty. Anyway, this was the first iteration of the intake mod. It elevated the intake a bit, but later I ordered some parts from Summit Racing and I picked up a 90 degree plastic elbow from AutoZone, and I was able to build this simple short ram intake. A little more Dremel tooling and I was able to isolate the mass airflow sensor piece. The air intake is even higher now and it is back away from the front splash zone. Since the car does a high idle to quickly warm up when you start it, the only acceptable exhaust mod, in my opinion, is the dual chamber axle back exhaust by Nameless. It uses a Hemholtz resonator to kill the unwanted frequencies while allowing the higher rev noises to bless the surroundings. I don't have this exhaust, but if I were to get one, it'd be this one. Andrew Will did a muffler delete pipe for me one day, but the highway drone was so annoying that I threw it away after two days. Scan gauge two. Everyone should have this device in their car. It connects to the OBD2 port and it displays a lot of useful information right out of the box. It can read and clear check engine codes, but it is especially useful because after entering some additional codes, it can display the transmission temperature also. The website has instruction and there are several YouTube videos explaining how to set it up. This is important because tough, slow terrain requires you to ride the torque converter a lot which pumps a lot of heat into the transmission, which can build up and be very damaging. At the very least, you should use this device to monitor the temp so that you can stop and let it cool when necessary. If you're serious about off-roading, or if you plan on towing, then a transmission cooler is a great addition. The Hayden 405 cooler is the largest cooler that fits. That thing that looks like a can of beans is the heat exchanger. Engine coolant, or radiator fluid, flows in and out of one side, while transmission oil, or CVT juice, flows in and out of the other side. There's a wall in between that keeps them separate, but heat is able to flow in between, from the hotter fluid to the colder fluid. When you start the car, the coolant is the first thing to warm up, and it helps the transmission oil warm up faster. As soon as the transmission oil reaches 170 degrees Fahrenheit, the fluid control thermostat opens, which allows the oil to circulate through the new radiator instead of just getting turned around and sent back. On average, I've noticed that my transmission temps are about 20 to 25 degrees lower than normal. Trailer hitch and lights. Unfortunately, the only hitch that Subaru offers is the inch and a quarter version. So if you want to pull a real trailer, you need to get an aftermarket two inch hitch like this. This one has prevented my bumper from getting torn off many times. There are a few install videos on YouTube. It's easy, it just takes a couple hours in the driveway. The trailer lights are even easier. Kurt makes an SK Forester specific kit that connects to a hidden plug under the trunk area. Just plug it in, then use a screw to make a ground connection to the chassis. Lights and electrical. I made a how-to video about my magnetically mounting light bar that is controlled by the normal high beam switch. I also made a video about how I installed my dash cam. I got this old school GPS from Best Buy. It's nice when you don't have cell service but you need directions, which has been very useful on a few trips. I replaced the simple 12 volt outlet in the cargo area with a 12 volt power panel, which includes USB charging ports. My most recent mod was painting the grill black and adding these amber running lights. They're LEDs, so the power consumption is low and they will last a long time. And you get 10 of them for $11, so I have 4 spares in case one burns out. Super easy bonus mod, fire extinguisher. This $20 fire extinguisher fits perfectly in the door drink holder. It's a snug fit and it's never made a peep. And I've had it there for a year. No problem hot sunny days, no problem slamming the door. 
it's a great $20 that could have a huge payoff if you ever need to use it. Before I hit the free mods, could you take a second to hit the like button and show your appreciation for all this information? Also, consider the subscribe button if you want to see my future videos. Now for this first one, I've got to give credit to my friend Brucey. He pointed out that most Subaru seats have a large plastic lumbar piece that is removable. Here you can see me removing it from the passenger seat. This is a reversible mod too, so if you don't like how the seat feels, you can always put it back. But I really like how much deeper and larger the seat feels without it. Next, we have the annoying seatbelt beeps. Let me start by saying always wear your seatbelt. But Subaru programmed a series of actions that will disable and re-enable the seatbelt beeps. Here's how. Hop in your car and turn the key to the on auxiliary position. Not all the way to engine running, but on. Buckle and unbuckle your seatbelt 20 times in 30 seconds, then fully start the car. This disabled the seatbelt chimes, and if you do it again, it'll re-enable it.